diagnosed with ovarian cancer or mesothelioma after using Johnson & Johnson talc products. Call our lawyers at 1-800-835-1207 now. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard were married in February of 2015. Then in March, Johnny went to Australia to film Pirates of the Caribbean 5. Amber was wrapping a project in London and flew down to Australia to join Johnny. But one month into the marriage, the honeymoon was clearly over. She threw the large bottle and it made contact and shattered. He just threw this glass across the kitchen, and I, it didn't hit me, but I, I, it shattered behind me, and I remember thinking that it like, very easily could have hit me. But what exactly happened in Australia is not clear. Johnny and Amber have much different accounts about who was attacking who. And then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed. I felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. He you know, my pubic bone. He said he was present. He was punching me. Tonight, we take a closer look at the violence, the allegations, and the aftermath of Johnny and Amber's three days together in Australia. Everybody, Politan, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Wow, we've got a lot to get to tonight and really going to focus on one part of the story of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And I want to begin by talking about getting married, right? When, when, when a, two people decide to exchange those vows and, and become husband and wife and, and, you know, till death do you part. It's an amazing time. It's an amazing moment. It is filled with what we call marital bliss. You're on cloud nine, everybody's happy. Everyone around you is celebrating this union. And it's the newness. You, you, you're now like, wow, I'm, we're, we're married. And there's this, this happiness that is supposed to surround that moment and that time in your lives together. But for Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, it wasn't about marital bliss. It was a marital mess. Think about everything that we've heard in the courtroom, right? About what happened before they finally got married in 2015. All the fights, all the blow-ups, the names, all these incidents. I mean, it, it's insanity. It is chaos. You know, this up and down, it's like, uh, I love you, I hate you. It's, it, it was toxic for all those years. And, and, and for these two, we are now, through this trial, experiencing their relationship. And it's something that the jury has to figure out about what really was going on. So when you've got Johnny Depp on the stand and he's talking about this marriage, and, and Amber Heard, he, he, he terms in a way, I, I, like, it's like I married my mother. And he spent so much time talking about the abuse at the hands of his mother growing up, how difficult it was, and he ended up marrying someone just like mom. I mean, that was his testimony. It's not a pretty picture, right? Like, if he, if he had a great childhood and, you know, he still loved his mother, but like had this great life and hey, I married someone just like mom, just like dear old mom. But it was, I married someone just like mommy dearest instead. Much different scenario. That, that was the picture. Now for Amber Heard, who did she marry? She got up there and told us that she married the monster. This man who abused her before and during this marriage and even after they split and knew that they were gonna be separated, he continued abusing her, emotionally, physically. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a horrendous picture, horrendous picture. So when you get married, right, there's like this, this time period shortly after you get married, right? It, it's, it's like the honeymoon period. 
And for some people, it might last a few months, for others, a few years, and for those lucky uh, folks out there, the rest of your lives, right? That honeymoon period. Well, part of the honeymoon period for Johnny and Amber was their time in Australia. Johnny was down there working on Pirates 5. Amber wrapped a, a project in, in London and flew down there. And we've heard the accounts of, of what took place down there. And this is just like a month after they're married, a month after exchanging vows and, and saying, this is it, I have found the one. It's you and me, kid, Slim and Steve, Johnny and Amber. And this is like a month later. Take a listen to their attorneys at the beginning of this trial giving their different versions of the chaos that was happening in bloody Australia. You will hear evidence that the people who cared about Mr. Depp were encouraging him to have a prenuptial agreement with Ms. Hurd. But she rushed the wedding date and he agreed to get married without one. After the wedding, Again, people close to Mr. Depp encouraged him to consider a post-nuptial agreement. When the topic came up, Ms. Hurd became outraged, as she always did, at the suggestion that Mr. Depp might leave her. She became so violent, in fact, she threw a vodka bottle at him that hit his hand and exploded. It severed the end of one of his fingers. You'll see pictures of Mr. Depp's severed finger and learn about his emergency medical treatment for that injury. As you go through those three days of Australia, some pretty horrendous things happen to her. He rips off her nightgown. He has her jammed up against a bar. He has hurled bottles and bottles at her. He has dragged her across the floor on the broken bottles and the liquor. He has punched her. He has kicked her. He tells her he's going to kill her. He hates her. He's pounding at her, pounding her. And then he penetrates her with a liquor bottle. That's the Johnny Depp that you're going to hear about in this case. And that was the honeymoon period. Didn't last long, did not last long. So what we're gonna do this hour is go through this entire scenario, uh, th this chaos in Australia. Let's begin, uh, let's bring in a couple of uh, experts, guests joining me tonight. In Los Angeles, California, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist and associate professor at Pepperdine University, Dr. Judy Ho is with us. And in River Edge, New Jersey, family law attorney, Janelle Weinstein. Great to have you both here. Um, a lot of tension in the air down in Australia when Johnny Depp and Amber Heard were together. Again, this is like not too long after the wedding. I want to begin and, and take a listen to Amber Heard's take on, on what was going on down there and what was creating the tension in the air. At some point early in that evening, he pulls out a bag of MDMA. I asked him what it was. And he told me it was MDMA. And I was surprised because at the time, that was, you know, like um, there was no question mark as to how I would respond to that, or so I thought. It's like, what do you, why would you even think that that's okay? He had already gotten clean and sober. I was, you know, touch and go, but he took the, um, a handful of pills, and I didn't count how many, but. Uh, when I came back downstairs, I did the math on the amount that was left, and I think it was either eight or ten, I can't recall as I sit here now, either eight or ten pills. We get in an argument. Uh, he was accusing me of uh, Eddie Redmayne, and uh, at, by this point, he thought I was working with Billy Bob Thornton on the movie I had just shot, but I had already worked with him a year earlier. Okay, uh, Dr. Judy Ho, as, as I'm listening to Amber Heard describe the situation in Australia, once she gets there, it's, it's Johnny Depp uh, breaking his sobriety, uh, and, and Johnny Depp also um, accusing Amber Heard of, of sleeping with 
Billy Bob Thornton, Eddie Redmayne, who was her co-star. I mean, there, so the tension from her perspective is all because of him and the, and the drugs and the jealousy. Right. And of course, this is Amber's side of the story. I'm sure that Johnny will have a very different account. Of we'll what get to his here. in just a second. We'll absolutely get to his in just a second. That's the way we roll here. Uh, but, but tell me about <laughs> Amber Heard. Tell me about Amber Heard and, and these concepts of, you know, one partner's, you know, got some issues, breaking sobriety, allegedly very jealous, uh, creating the tension here. That's right. And again, you know, Amber right now is saying, look, Johnny was the instigator. He was the one who was supposed to be sober. This was supposed to be a nice trip. We were supposed to have a nice time, celebrate, relax. And here he is bringing all this tension into the marriage. I don't know if this was really the first time that there was chaos in this relationship though. I believe that it was probably there from the beginning based on all of the accounts that we have heard. And this is actually something that they're used to, this push and pull and they're fighting and making up and maybe in the beginning it's exciting. And then at some point it doesn't, excite them anymore and it's just terrible and everybody feels bad at the end of it but i believe that the chaos was likely there from the very beginning but in the beginning it feels more like excitement it feels more like an adrenaline rush that dopamine rush maybe it actually caused them to fall more in love with each other in the beginning because of that perception of excitement yeah uh, janelle I, I know you have to deal with folks after they're no longer in love um, but here it looks like the, the honeymoon did not last long at all. This is like a month after they exchange vows and, and there's this tension already um, in Australia. Amber Heard's perspective, the tension is a result of his lack of sobriety, his jealousy. Classic, right? Yes, and, and the interesting part here, right, the honeymoon didn't last that long, neither did the marriage after that. So like your other guest said they started out in chaos that's what they know they both came from chaos and so here they are in this relationship getting excited by it getting bothered by it getting frustrated by it, getting violent by it and by the end of it here they are this three-day argument blood bottles allegations of sexual abuse and it doesn't take long for this marriage to be over. So I think that's very telling. Uh, and when their people are getting divorced, they are at most of the time at their worst stage. But in this relationship, I think the stages have all been bad. I haven't seen any testimony, if you believe either side, where this relationship had the real honeymoon stage. It was always chaos, codependency, and violence. Yeah. It's sad, it's sad on, on many different levels. Um, now, let's get to Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp testified also about some of the tension in the air and what was the cause of the tension down in Australia. Here's Johnny's version. What did Ms. Heard tell you she was upset about when she arrived in Australia? Ms. Heard told me that The attorney that she met with was um, rude and dismissive and all she was being shown was a uh, an example of a, a postnuptial agreement. What really surprised me was that she kept saying, I'm not even in your will. I'm not even in your will. I thought that was an odd thing to say. Um, especially since I, I, I don't think anybody had had time to change wills or anything of that nature. Um, so th th those things just didn't it felt uh, wrong. All I could do was try to calm her down and say that I was not out to screw her over or, or, or put her in a position that was, uh, was uncomfortable. Did that work? These were stock, these were normal things to do. It did not work, no. It escalated and escalated and t turned into... Uh, Madness, chaos. 
Can you please violence? Okay, Janelle, uh, first uh, clarify for us what a postnuptial is and how well do they go over? Like, I, I understand like a prenuptial before you get married. Okay, let's take care of it. But now, hey, we got married, but uh, hey, take a look here. Well, a postnuptial agreement is an agreement during the marriage that talks about the issues in the event you got divorced or if in the event you're going to pass away. And what happens, though, is postnuptials aren't always that uh, enforceable. So there's real issues with them to begin with. But the conversation was started. And whether it's a prenup or a postnuptial agreement, it becomes a very tense situation, even in the best situation. So here we have these two volatile parties and the attorneys have to have their clients put on this cap, like in the event something happens to your spouse or you, in the event you get divorced, we've got to look at these issues. And it is a very tight rope to walk so that people don't get upset because they're like, we're just in our marriage. This is the best time of our life. Why do we have to talk about this? So postnuptials aren't necessarily all that common. People like to try to get them and have an agreement because they're, there's a question of the enforceability. But certainly here, this conversation wasn't going to go over well with these particular parties. And it's not surprising at all. Yeah, it's another uh, honeymoon killer. I would call it the post up. Okay, Dr. Judy Ho, Janelle Weinstein staying with us. When we come back, uh, we're going to go from the tension in the air to the first allegation of real extreme violence, an alleged sexual assault by Johnny Depp, the victim, the accuser, his own wife, Amber Heard.
unmgc.edu. I couldn't... I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get through to him. I couldn't... I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand this. We are talking about what happened down in Australia. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It's been a big part of this trial. Um, very differing... Uh, uh, descriptions of what happened, but this is the part where Amber Heard is describing um, a sexual assault. That's absolutely what she is describing. Uh, make no mistake, she's describing a crime here. That's what she's alleging. Let's listen now to Amber Heard uh, describe this alleged sexual assault. The, the next thing I remember... <laughs> I was bent over um, backwards on the bar, meaning my chest was up. I was staring at the blue lights, and my chest was on this. My back was on the countertops, and I thought he was punching me. I felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. He you know, on my pubic bone, and I, he said he was, said he was punching me. And I remember her that he's just not wanting to move because I didn't know if it was broken. I didn't know if the bottle that he had inside me was broken. Let's bring back in our guest, still with us, clinical and forensic neuro psychologist and associate professor at Pepperdine University, Dr. Judy Ho, family law attorney Janelle Weinstein, also joining us now in Alexandria, Virginia, New York Times best-selling author of the book, You Can't Lie to Me, retired ATF investigator and world-renowned body language expert, Janine Driver. All right, uh, Janine, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, what are you seeing and hearing as Amber Heard describes what is a, it's a crime, it's a sexual assault, that's what she's alleging. Um, what are you seeing from the way she's describing this, the way she's telling the jury what uh, happened here? Well, first things first, I see you got my text message to wear purple tonight, so I'm glad we're on the same page here, Vinny. Absolutely. Uh, get, getting into Amber here, uh, this is bad acting. This is bad acting, and, and studies have proven, Vinny, that when you fake cry, there's a disconnect. When you are really crying, people will feel a, a, an increase in rapport with you. When you are really crying, people want to help. They feel that you're authentic. They feel that you're competent and you're honest. Fake crying, our brain picks up on it. It's called an N400. Your body and brain are literally picking up on, I'm just not buying this. I don't know. There was a, a track star, Marilyn, uh, I'm forgetting her name right now, but she Jones? used drugs. Yeah, Marilyn Jones. And she lied at first and fake cried and no one bought it. When she came out and confessed to lying to police just before she went to jail, those are real tears and we had compassion. She's doing a disservice here. Also, she's very likable. And what I mean by that is she likes to use the word like. She's using it like often. She says things like, it looked like he was punching me. It felt like he was on top of me. It felt like he was patting me down. This use of a like is not that it's actually happening. If we look at her compared to Johnny Depp, Johnny illustrates it. They're called illustrators. He says his arm is here. The, the, the bottle comes here. Even when Johnny talks about the bottle coming at him, Vinny, he leans his head back like this. When we are telling the truth, we go in the story as us, not as a participant observing it. When Amber tells the story, she either becomes Johnny or she becomes a third party demonstrating what was happening as if we're looking from a bird's eyes view. This is indicative of a deception. Dr. Judy Ho, um, she is describing an extremely traumatic event. From your experience, when someone is reliving trauma, what, 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 will manifest itself? What will we see when someone is, is reliving that, that horrific moment? Well, I will say, Vinny, everybody deals with trauma in different ways. 
But when you have been through trauma and when you have to relive it, sometimes people do start to hyperventilate. They have what looks like a panic attack. They start to have physiological symptoms that are manifested, like they start sweating or they have difficulties breathing. They have difficulty having words come out and making it sound logical. And other times people talk about their trauma very matter of factly. Sometimes there's no emotion at all. It's almost like they're talking about it as if it happened to somebody else. Now, we don't know what happened. The only people who know what happened that day is Johnny and Amber. But what we do know sometimes is that as individuals are reliving their trauma, and she's obviously aware that she is in a public medium, it does change the way that you talk about it. She knows that everybody's watching her. She knows that there's cameras. I wonder how she would talk about it in a therapist room with a friend or when she's just processing this by herself. I bet all of those reactions would be very different than what we see on the stand. Now, there was another moment associated uh, with the testimony about this attack that was pretty unexpected. It's where she identified the object, the bottle that she says was used. Take a listen. What do you, what more do you recall? You would have, sorry, it took me a minute to respond because it's hard. Um, it took me a minute to respond because I had not remembered seeing the bottle that Johnny was using on me. I hadn't, I didn't have a memory of seeing it. And this picture um, I wasn't aware of until just the, the other day, yesterday, the day before. And um, and I felt my stomach tighten up, like I was going to be sick when I saw it. Because even though I didn't remember seeing the bottle, what I had remembered is a pressure, like something square, which is why I thought he was punching me. And I hadn't seen this bottle. I didn't know. And then this came out in Ben's evidence, because he didn't share it until this. Date Judging your honor trial. sustained. And so I recognize it. Janelle Weinstein, this is one of those moments that I, I clearly was not expecting, but she seems to be blaming the attorney. I didn't see it until now. And then she's reacting to it, identifying uh, the alleged object that was used. The bottom line, when we talk about a sexual assault like this, um, one thing that you might expect is a trip maybe to the ER, to the emergency room, some more injuries, and, and we're not seeing it, and I don't think the jury is going to see any of that evidence. Well, unfortunately, we know that some victims of sexual assault don't report, don't go to the emergency room. It's Johnny Depp. I don't know if there's other people that take care of uh, medical things on site. But I think, you know, next week is coming soon. And when cross-examination starts, it's going to be very interesting to see how she holds up. And Johnny, at the end of the day, has to prove that what she's saying is false. So the more they can discredit her, the better it is. But it's fascinating to me to see what the jury is going to think of this testimony and Johnny Depp's testimony and where they'll end at the end of the day because... Someone's lying. I don't know what happened. Someone is lying. Uh, Janine Driver, hold that thought. Hold that thought. You know I've got a clock, right? Just like the lawyers in the case have limited amount of time, we do also. So Janelle Weinstein, Dr. Judy Ho, thank you so much. Janine Driver is going to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about what happened next or allegedly happened next down in Australia, which was, well, we know Johnny Depp severed his finger, but how did it happen? How did he end up in the hospital? Both sides of the story when we return.
Download RoboKiller today. All right. We are taking a look at what happened down in Australia. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It's a big part of the case, big part of the trial. And, and the jury's got to figure out what really happened to understand the nature of the relationship and who is the abuser and who is the victim. So here's Johnny Depp describing, from his perspective, how his finger got severed. Then she came down to the bar and found me there. And of course started screaming, oh, you're drinking again, yeah, the monster and all that. Um, so she reached, she, she, she walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka and then just uh, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me. And, and it, it uh, it just went <laughs> right past my head and smashed behind me. Uh, so I stood up and I walked behind the bar and there was a larger bottle of vodka, the kind with the handle, you know, on it. I grabbed that and I went and I sat in my seat again I opened the bottle and I poured myself a shot and drank it. Miss Heard was flinging insults uh, left, right, and center, and she then grabbed that bottle and uh, and threw that at me. It was a large bottle, and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. And I, I honestly didn't, I didn't feel the pain at first at all. I felt no pain whatsoever. What I felt was, um, I felt heat. I felt heat and I felt um, as if something were dripping down my hand, you know. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed. And uh, I was looking directly at my bones. All right, still with us, New York Times best-selling author of You Can't Lie to Me, retired ATF investigator, world-renowned body language expert, Janine Driver. And joining us now in Washington, D.C., journalist from overseas who covered Depp's U.K. libel trial, Nick Wallace back with us. You can also check him out on the reporting Depp v. Heard podcast. It's amazing. Uh, Nick, great to see you. To me, this is, this is a crucial, crucial episode here. Um, you know, there's a lot of allegations back and forth, but this story about the finger, very specific uh, by Johnny Depp and how it happened. And th the question is, will the jury believe this? What, what was it like watching him describe this moment inside that courtroom? Well, because he slows everything down and he talks everything through in, in that drawl that he's got, A, it's brilliant for reporters who, are, who don't have shorthand because we can take down every word he's saying, but it, it did have an effect the same way that Amber Heard's testimony had an effect. And, and of course, this is the sort of bloody climax. This is the squalid climax to this three-day alleged hostage situation that Amber Heard has mentioned both in the 2020 trial and in, and in this 2022 trial. And yet, again, their versions of what happened are diametrically opposed. She says this was all about him bashing a phone against the wall and smashing his finger to bits with this phone, uh, yelling obscenities. And, and she felt that, that this was her that he was talking about as he smashed this phone against the wall. His is that it's all about a vodka bottle that, that she threw at him and landed on his fingers as they were on the bar. Again, it's one of those situations where no one else was in the room with them. How do they remember exactly what happened?
how much of Johnny Depp had to drink. She said he'd taken eight to ten ecstasy pills before this episode, and he was drinking from the bottle of, uh, of wine before he moved on to the vodka. So trying to parse this, trying to, trying to make sense of this as a journalist, let alone as a body language expert or a juror, crucially, is very, very difficult because there is so little common ground in, in their two explanations of what went on. Absolutely. Sorry, right, Janine, what did you see? Um, what did you notice about the way Johnny Depp told this jury that Amber Heard is the one who severed his finger? When you watch a movie and you just don't buy the acting, the reason that is is because the gesture comes a beat after the words. So if I said to you, call me, it looks like this, call me, not call me. And when Johnny Depp is talking, he shows the gesture. He looks down at his thumb before he talks about his thumb. He's demonstrating the illustrator, this movement before the word. It's a half a second before. We don't see that with Amber. And again, this is going to come across to many people, including the jurors, as inauthentic. So either she's lying or she's bad acting. It's not coming across as authentic. And then when she repeats those statements like she did earlier, and she says it over and over again, the reason I'm, I'm caught off guard with this picture. The reason I'm caught off with guard with this picture, this is something we saw Casey Anthony do, talking about calling the babysitter's phone number. I called Zaneda, the phone was dead. I called Zaneda, the phone is dead. These are stalling techniques and they are used by master manipulators to stall, to get time to what to say next. She just, in my opinion, my expert opinion comes across as inauthentic. Law enforcement between the two would definitely be questioning Amber a lot longer than Johnny at this point. Speaking of Amber Heard, let's take a listen now to her describe the moment uh, that she finds out Johnny Depp's finger has been severed. He's standing at the office desk. He had his hand wrapped in this, uh, like, rags or, you know, bandana rags. And I, I think he took them down or somehow showed me and he said, look what you made me do. I did this for you, something to that effect. And I kind of put together, it was covered in paint. And I put together that that's like he was using his finger. I quickly became aware that that's what he was using as a paintbrush, even though there was lots of paintbrushes around. Um, and we didn't have any sort of like coherent conversation, as you can imagine. Um, I figured out he was missing a finger. He kind of held it up, and I said, "What did you do? When? Like, what? What did you do? When?" And I realized in my head that there had been many hours since this probably happened, assuming that that was the happened with the phone. Uh, in any case, I I knew it had been way too long that he had had this blood, you know, that he was bleeding, and uh, I said, I'm going to call 911 if you don't call Jerry now. Uh, I don't, I still don't recall which of us um, called Jerry Judge, his security. Nick, and I don't know if the jury is with me on this, I, my... I don't have a clear picture of, of, of her version of these three days. It's a little, it's a little hazy for me. Um, is, is it clear to you where she is all this time? Is she, is she sleeping upstairs? I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand this three-day, um, you know, bender or whatever, however she described what was happening. Like, what is she doing? When are they eating? When, you know, when are these things happening? Well, according to her, he wasn't sleeping. He was uh, doing drugs and staying up all night drinking. She disappears off the scene to have sleep and then comes back down and finds the place in even more of a mess than it was before. And and the, the chronology of it, I, I must admit, listening to her testimony, I wasn't quite sure I followed how it, how it happened over two nights. But by the same token, it's what you're watching is an actor recreate a performance of something which may or may not be true, which is also apparently wrapped in PTSD, if you believe the psychologist who was hired by her team, and therefore comes through in certain fragments of memory. And, and, and fragments is a really key word because it's one of the ones that Johnny Depp, I think, used in the 2020 trial when he talked about, yes, his prodigious drug and, and drink use meant that sometimes his memory was a little fragmentary when, when he came to recollect things. So who's 
actual recollection of events is the most reliable, how they then deliver it to a courtroom, how much they are consciously aware in terms of information that they have to put in front of the jury because it will help their case and how much they are just retelling from their, their heart, as it were, makes this a, a very, very difficult nut to crack in the best of circumstances, notwithstanding these sort of huge external cultural pressures and the examination that programs like this do on top of it. Absolutely. Janine Driver, before we go, I, only, I literally have 20 seconds. Go I've ahead. I've got it. He says, wow. And she goes, look what I, he goes, she goes, Johnny said, look what I did for you. Look what I did for you. And you see Johnny go like this. Wow. And he nods his head. Yes. You'll never hear me talk about head movement, meaning yes or no, because we move our head in directions, not just what we're hearing and saying, but our internal dialogue. So in this moment, he could be saying, she even, she's even saying, I cut my finger for her. Unbelievable. But he's nodding her his head. Yes. Thinking, I knew this was coming. Typical Amber. Do not use head nods in one direction or another for deception. It's inaccurate. Janine Driver, body language expert. Great to have you aboard. Thanks so much. Nick Walsh is going to stay with us. When we come back, we'll take a look at the aftermath of what took place down in Australia. Before this trial, did you know who Carly Simon was? Uh, I might have heard her music, but no, I didn't. Okay. Did you know what songs Carly Simon wrote or sang? No, you had to tell me.
I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like, but that's probably the closest that I've ever been. I didn't, nothing made sense. And I knew in my mind and in my heart, this is, this is not life. This is not life. <laughs> no one should have to go through this. I started to write with my blood in my own blood on the on the walls. Um, little reminders from our past that essentially represented lies that she had told me and lies that I had caught her in. That's Johnny Depp explaining what we in the legal business call bad facts, which are that the walls in this house were painted with his blood. There's pictures of it. They went into evidence that the jury has seen them. They know that this actually happened. So Johnny Depp uh, explaining from his perspective why and how it happened that he's painting the walls with his own blood from his severed finger. This, again, this, let's remember the beginning of the show. This is shortly after they got married that all this is happening. Call Carly Simon. She said it better, babe. That's, uh, I think, you're so vain, maybe? I don't know. Let's take a listen to the house manager uh, from Australia, Ben King, who was the house manager there, um, asked about a recording that was apparently being made during the cleanup of whatever happened in that home in Australia. Did you come to understand that there was a phone in the house that was recording as people were cleaning up? Um, at that time, no. But you now, you now know that there was a phone that was recording people as they were cleaning up, correct? Uh, objection, foundation, hearsay. I, I'm not asking for a particular statement. No, that's, that's fine. I'll loud if he knows. I believe that, that came up somewhere later on. At that time, I wasn't aware, but I believe I became aware of it later, yes. Okay, what's on that recording? Wasn't played in court. Nick Wallace is still with us. Uh, incredible journalist, covered the first trial in the UK, has a great podcast reporting, Dep V Heard. Nick, do we know what's on that recording that came up during the cross-examination uh, of Ben King? If, if it is the same recording that I am remembering from the 2020 trial, which was released in evidence, then yes, it, it is public. It is out there on the internet. It's again, it's inconclusive because it's people talking about the damage and it's people talking about um, what may or may not have happened. And it's largely indistinct, but it, it's interesting that it wasn't played in court. And, and one of the fascinating things for me about this trial is how little evidence compared to the 2020 trial, which was ruled on by a single judge is actually being shoveled in the direction of the jury because not only are they not going to be able to read the transcripts they can only read from their own notes they have a very limited uh, amount of agreed evidence that they're able to make a decision on so so much of this trial is going to be based on what they hear given in testimony in court which is fascinating given given that that is what's being broadcast around the world but yeah there's nothing damning from memory forgive me if i'm i'm, I'm on the spot here uh, that actually conclusively says one thing or another because the clear up is simply about who's gone where to to sort their finger out with 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 johnny depp and and what's going to be done about the actual situation in the house which costs tens of thousands of dollars to repair unbelievable we're looking at pictures a beautiful beautiful home let's take a listen to one more piece of testimony because ben king um was escorting amber heard when she was leaving australia and she says something let's listen um, in way of conversation wasn't a great deal to be honest I did sort of say finally so what happened you know obviously referring to the house and I mean she didn't give much explanation if any she did say um, Ben have you ever been so angry with someone you just lost it with them um, uh, and I sort of said uh, no Nick Wallace, should we take away from that that she is 
admitting losing it, that it was her that lost it, or, or is that her describing him losing it? But, but interestingly, it was exactly the same phrase that he used in evidence in the 2020 trial, exactly the same phrase. And I think that's what he's tacitly suggesting, that that was an admission by Amber Heard that she was responsible for what had happened. Although it was, again, quite strange that he wasn't asked to explain what he meant by that. So it's left hanging in the air in the minds of the jury. Yeah, it really is, because this... Let me just ask you this. We have less than a minute now left here. Um, you've been eyeballing this jury. Um, what, what sort of takeaway do you have of this jury? Because it's a very unusual jury, I will tell you that first. But what are your thoughts? I was uh, swapping notes with a legal observer who was in court on, on Thursday, and I was particularly interested in, in their take on Amber Heard's um, explanation of, of, of her testimony. And... They, she agreed, the, the legal observer that I was speaking to, that they were very impassive. They have been throughout this trial. They are not giving much away. There are three of the nine of them who are wearing masks, which obviously makes them even harder to read. The only reaction that she described to me was when Amber Heard uh, gave this shocking testimony that you've played excerpts of on Thursday. And then the- Nick, the we're out of time. I got a hard break. I'm so sorry. Nick Wallace, great to have you. Depth v. Heard podcast. Check it out, folks. We'll see you again soon.
Download the Experian app now. In Fairfax County, Virginia, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. The trial everyone is talking about and everyone has an opinion about. Johnny suing Amber for defamation after she claimed to be a survivor of domestic abuse. Each is accusing the other of being the aggressor in the relationship. She walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka and then just uh, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me. He kind of like shoves me down on the sofa and I get up and I'm trying to get him off of me and it's just stronger than me. I don't know how else to describe it. And at some point he just whacks me in the face. Tonight, we take a look at the one thing both sides agree on. Johnny Depp used a lot of drugs and alcohol during their relationship. But did that use lead to Johnny's violence or to Amber's violence? The think tank weighs in. In Boston, Massachusetts, celebrity chef Mario Batali on trial charged with indecent assault and battery. Today, the shocking verdict. I'm going to find the defendant not guilty to the charge of indecent assault and battery. And on the docket in Palm Beach County, Florida, the killer clown trial. Sheila Keen Warren accused of dressing up like a clown and murdering Marlene Warren, then marrying her husband. We have a preview of the upcoming trial on Court TV. Plus, there were problems in their relationship long before they tied the knot. Tonight's 13th juror question, why do you think Johnny married Amber? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Why did Johnny Depp marry Amber Heard? And why did Amber Heard marry Johnny Depp? I mean, there was so much trouble before that wedding. The wedding was 2015. 2015, they met 2009. Started dating officially, I guess, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Arguments, fights. It was brutal. It was chaotic. That's not love, folks. Let me just tell you, that's not love. That is crazy. That is insanity. That is chaos. If that's what's happening in your relationship, go the other way. That's my advice. That's my advice. They didn't ask me, though, so they got married. Um, what I want to do, they're... They don't agree on much in this case, Amber Heard's side, Johnny Depp's side, but, but I think there is a little bit of common ground, and that is the, the, the acknowledgement that Johnny Depp was using a lot of drugs and alcohol during this relationship. Joy Lim Nackerin, Court TV legal correspondent, has more on that issue. A public figure describes his very private struggles with substance abuse and addiction. At about the age of I don't know, four or five years old, I, I can remember vividly my, my mom telling me to go get her nerve pills, you know, um, out of her purse. Actor Johnny Depp revealed his early encounters with drugs during direct examination testimony in his defamation trial against ex-wife Amber Heard. When I was 11 years old, um... I wanted to calm down, and I didn't know how to. So I, I'd bring my mom her nerve pill. I would walk away, and I would take one myself. He told the court he turned to drugs and alcohol during his troubled childhood, riddled with abuse by his own mother. She had the ability to be as, as cruel as anyone can be um, with all of us. He even detailed how his struggles with substance abuse persisted into adulthood. I have taken these substances over the years on and off um, to numb, to numb myself of, of, uh, of the, the ghosts, the wraiths that were 
still with me. It's something Heard's attorney, Benjamin Rottenborn, grilled him on during cross-examination. In fact, your sister's had a number of worries about your drug consumption over many, many years since your youth that you've become aware of, correct? Uh, in, in my youth. It happened time and again. You were abusing alcohol toward the end of your relationship with your prior partner, Vanessa Parody, correct? I was drinking. You were drinking pretty heavily. Were you there? That's my question to you, sir. The question is, how will all this play to the jury? Substance use issues are really difficult to treat. Oftentimes, a person doesn't have insight. And as Johnny himself said, this was something that was derived from trauma. Clinical and forensic psychologist Dr. Judy Ho explains that some jurors may frown on drug and alcohol abuse. There's still a lot of stigma about substance use disorders. And sometimes uh, the person who is suffering will be blamed for their behaviors, believing that it's all volitional, believing that it's a choice to use drugs. And I think that for some people, they're gonna see this as Johnny escaping responsibility for some of the things that he did. But she also points out that addiction is increasingly more seen as a disease. I think a lot of people are going to sympathize with Johnny, particularly people who might have been through substance abuse disorders themselves or have seen it in family members and can see how much it can not only tear a family apart, but also tear the person apart. Um, perhaps there will be some forgiveness that there's a illness here that needs to be worked on and that Johnny is maybe starting to be committed to working on that for himself. That could mean the aggressive questioning from Heard's attorney could boomerang. If he comes down too hard on Johnny for his substance abuse issues, not only is he creating more stigma around mental illness in general and particularly substance abuse, he's also going to be looked at as somebody who's kicking someone while they're down because Johnny is sharing that the substance abuse issues developed as a result of the pervasive trauma that he experienced. There's definitely going to be a delicate balance here. I think it's a big issue in this case. And, you know, how does this jury interpret this issue of Johnny Depp and his use of drugs and alcohol? Let's bring in our think tank. They know a lot more about this than I do. In Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor and law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling with us. In Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Ann Bremner. And in West Palm Beach, Florida, former police lieutenant, trial attorney, Rick King, clean shaven, ready to go tonight, <laughs> looking sharp. Looks, yeah, looks Rick great. must be on trial. Rick, Rick, Rick must be on trial, baby. Shaved his whole beard. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just finished. Uh, clean closer. Getting closer. Awesome. All right, Michael, let me start with you. This is, let's not forget who this jury is. And I keep bringing folks back to this because it was very unusual when I walked into that courtroom. Young and male young and male like in their 20s five of the nine seven will deliberate um how how do you think they're looking at this issue of drug and alcohol use and potential abuse here do they blame the person or do they see the person as someone you know with a disease is there any sympathy towards someone uh, who is using or abusing these substances yeah, I mean, I think we've got to take more than their age into account. I think we've got to think about a couple of things. One is that the plaintiff in this case, Johnny Depp, the original plaintiff in this case, not the counter plaintiff, is the one who actually chose the venue and the jurisdiction, right? Because when you file the lawsuit, you have to demonstrate or, or, or demonstrate that there's proper jurisdiction, there's proper venue. So Johnny Depp is actually the one who, did, who chose the venue and the jurisdiction in this case. So he understood the type of jurors, the type of jury they were going to get. And lawyers don't take that calculation lightly. They made that intentionally and deliberately. Uh, the second thing we've got to think about, Vinny, is not only uh, their age uh, and their experience, but also their background. Uh, do they have family members who have suffered from abuse? And you have to uh, uh, at least anticipate that the jurors were asked those questions. We weren't in jury uh, in the voir dire, but you have to anticipate they were asked these questions because they knew this would be an issue at trial. So the question really becomes, Vinny, is the jurors, despite their age, despite their uh, gender, despite their particular identities, 
Uh, what is the background of their family members? Do they have family members who may have experienced uh, uh, substance abuse or individuals in their lives who have experienced substance abuse and how they have empathy or, you know, for those individuals. And you have to believe that at least some of the jurors will see that issue very clearly, that they will see that uh, there are individuals in their lives who've experienced substance abuse and they will have at least some empathy for that. Now, um, this issue is being played differently by both sides. Let's start with Amber Heard's side and what they're saying, and it's a clear theme, that Johnny Depp on drugs, Johnny Depp uh, under the influence of alcohol becomes the monster. Right. Here's Amber Heard. And eventually it get bored and then I'd see him drinking again. Um, when I started to get upset, noticing the pattern um, of the violence going with the, the drinking and drugs, then I, then he started sneaking it. So it became less clear and I'd have to look for clues as to what he was on. So I just knew how to react, you know? Uh, Johnny on speed is very different from Johnny on opiates. Uh, Johnny on opiates, very different from <sighs> Adderall and, 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 and cocaine Johnny, which is very different from Quaaludes Johnny. But I, I had to get good at paying attention to the different versions of him. Uh, 2012, I was in um, I was in the beginning stages of this, just learning these patterns. I was just learning that drinking kind of correlated with the violence. Okay, and Bremner, what do you think about um, how persuasive is this a correlation, this theory that the defense has that they're going to argue to the jury that? There's different Johnnies, and cocaine Johnny is doing one thing, Johnny with the alcohol doing something else, but that is, that is the instrument that then turns Johnny into this violent person. Well, I think it's a good strategy for a number of reasons, Benny. I think, first of all, is you can blame the alcohol and the drugs and not blame the person. And that, that's, I think, a good strategy because people like Johnny Depp. The second part is, if you believe that he's a different person under those circumstances, as she describes, you've got to have that strategy because he's won the popular vote in this case on social media and everywhere. It's all Team Johnny. What you're left with is basically the electoral college, you know, like the jury is going to make a decision. But he's really won the popular vote, even though he's admitted all of these terrible things, blood on the walls, you know, violence, things like that. He's won. So they need to make that person that everyone loves different from the person, the monster that she saw. Uh, Rick King, let me ask you, um, from your experience uh, on the police force, people under the influence of drugs, do different drugs make people violent versus another way? From your experience, did you, did you see that? Does, that? does that have a ring of truth to you? Not only from my experience as a police officer, but just as my from my experiences in life, people respond differently under different stimulus. And you know, some people are loving drunks, some people are angry drunks. It just depends on what your what your body metabolism is. And so, some people who are on uh, cocaine and drugs like that, they respond differently than than if they were so if the same person, or maybe even a different person was on some sort of heroin or opiate type drug. Um, those are all very, very different responses from different people. And they can be, those drugs taken, those same drugs taken by one person can have very different responses. Um, and so her testimony rings true in that she would have to determine what he was taking to determine what her response would be. That makes sense to me. Um, I don't know if overall her testimony is moving the needle for me, but that part of it rings true to me. All right. Now, Johnny Depp's team has a different take on the impact of Johnny's drug and alcohol use. It, it, when he does that and he breaks his sobriety, sobriety, it gets Amber really angry and she becomes violent, responding to him using the drugs and alcohol, including what happened down in Australia. Take a listen. I went behind the bar, I grabbed a bottle of vodka that was there, and a shot glass, and sat at the bar. She was nowhere around, and I 
poured myself two or three stiff shots of, uh, of the vodka. First taste of alcohol I'd had in a long time. And um, then she came down to the bar and found me there. And of course started screaming, oh, you're drinking again, yeah, the monster and all that. Um, so she reached, she, she, she walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka and then just uh, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me. Michael Sterling, what do you what do you think of, of this? Because this is what the jury's gonna gonna have to figure out here. On the one hand, Amber Heard is saying the drugs, the alcohol, depending on what he's taking, make Johnny violent. Whereas Johnny Depp saying, no, when when I take that stuff, she reacts to it in a violent way. Vinny, I'm gonna tell you what's really what really caught my eye as I watched that. It is that Amber Heard is staring Johnny Depp down. And when you look at when Amber Heard is testifying, Johnny Depp is looking down and writing notes. Almost, you know, that really catches me because um, it almost seems like Amber Heard in this particular circumstance is trying to intimidate Johnny Depp, I, I right? Do. I mean, and she may be one of the few people on earth who's able to do that. And Johnny Depp is trying to avoid eye contact. He's taking notes. So I only say that, Vinny, to say that it, when I view what you just asked me in light of how I'm looking at the aesthetics and the body language, it almost feels like, you know, Johnny comes off as more credible. He comes off as more truthful, whereas Amber, mm -hmm. not so much. It seems like she's staring him down, trying to intimidate him. Yeah, you're, yeah and you're not alone, Michael. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. go on TikTok, hashtag justice for Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> Over 10 billion views. I don't have, I don't have TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Justice you for Amber TikTok? Heard, 36 million. So no. um, that's what they're saying. All right, when we come back, another celebrity who was accused of horrific behavior went to trial. You saw it on Court TV, a big verdict today uh, involving celebrity chef Mario Batali. We'll show you what happened when we come back.
www.nix.com. There was touching of my breasts, touching of my rear end, touching of my sensitive feminine areas um, in between my legs, t touching all over my face, um, his lips on the side of my face, his tongue in my ear. Okay, that was celebrity chef Mario Batali listening to the woman who accused him of groping her as they were taking a selfie inside a public restaurant in front of a whole bunch of folks. Um, that trial ended today. Let's show you a little bit of the closing arguments and then the verdict. No jury, just the judge. This quick interaction, this indecent assault and battery, all happened in under three minutes. Plenty of time for the defendant to grope Miss Teeny all over her body, but no time at all for Miss Teeny to fully realize what was happening to her, let alone figure out what the appropriate response would be. How could you possibly expect a 28 year old young woman to know exactly how to react to being sexually assaulted by a much older, powerful celebrity in a moment that was over in a flash in a couple of selfies? She's seeking far in excess of $50,000 here. We know that she lied and scammed a gym for $200. What would she do for more than $50,000? We know the lengths that she went to go to get out of that gym membership with her mother enlisting her to create a fake lease, basically bamboozling a businesswoman at a gym for 200 bucks. So what wouldn't she do to score a big hit with a celebrity chef that she took selfies with. And I'm sure plenty of people might tell a white lie about I'm moving away and tell them that. But to go to the trouble to create a fake legal document, to then email it and tell a crazy story about New Hampshire, and then it becomes, I'm actually in Western Mass, that's beyond the pale. That's not normal, everyday lying. That shows an ability and a willingness to engage in a well thought out, pre planned fraud. Commonwealth has not met its burden to the degree that's required by law. So Mr. Batali and Attorney Fuller and Caruso, if you could rise, I'm, I'm going to find the defendant not guilty to the charge of indecent assault and battery. And that's it. It's over. Let's bring back in our think tank and try to figure out what, what happened. Like I blinked my eyes, I missed the trial. Ann Bremner. <laughs> Do, do, you know, we've been talking a lot about the impact of the, of the of Me Too inside courtrooms right. across America. Is it over? I was going to say, let's retire the hashtag of Me Too. I mean, at least in the Amber Heard circumstance, based on TikTok and social media, just public response. And then this case. But I always say you can't say believe women always. I mean, you just can't. I mean, it's really does a disservice to women. I mean, why would you say that? I mean, the basic premise is you've got to judge credibility by judge in this case or by jury in a jury trial or in other circumstances. So in a way, it kind of makes women powerless saying, just believe all women. And so I think it's good to have critical analysis these days and to have a judge in this case make the right decision. It sounds like it was the right decision and see what the jury does in the Depp versus her trial. Rick, what happened? What happened in Boston? So what happened in Boston was there was 10 selfies. And during the course of these 10 selfies, the, you know, the, uh, the victim claimed that she was touched in her private areas um, over and over again, except for there were 10 selfies. And so at some point, the, you know, the defense lawyer said, well, when did this happen? Because during the pictures, during the, did it happen? Because she said it happened the entire time. And it, this came down to a question of credibility. Her credibility was just, was just, uh, it was, it, it was challenged, and she couldn't answer the questions to the to the satisfaction of the judge. And then this is a case where they decided to take take the case to a bench trial. And mm -hmm. and I think the old the, the old adage of know thy judge, they picked correctly right. because this judge understood the credibility you know aspect of what was going on, and the text messages talking about you know, how they wanted to make $10,000. All those things came into play, and I think this was a credibility question, and she lost. Michael Sterling, uh, do you think this 
would play any differently in front of a jury as opposed to a judge. And, and you know, judges understand the burden of proof better than anyone. They're the ones who have to explain it to us, right? So presumably they should understand that better than us. Um, do you think, though, in, in, the, in the world we're in now, because this is a, a credibility issue, Batali didn't testify, but it's still a credibility of the accuser, uh, much like it's going to be a credibility call in Fairfax County, Virginia. Yeah, Benny, I don't, I'm not sure it would have played much differently uh, in front of a jury, uh, except that the trial would have probably taken a lot longer, right? <laughs> uh, otherwise, I'm not sure would have. I'm not sure it would have played differently. But I always, you know, I like to talk to jurors about what I call my grandfather's test. My grandfather. Father's a rice farmer, and he would cut deals with people, and he would just shake their hands. He didn't have long, drawn-out contracts or things like that, and he would just shake their hands. And you know, if he promised you rice or this amount of rice, and you promised him this, they would just shake hands. And so, I often talk to jurors about the handshake test. My grandfather's test and so when you talk about credibility the question becomes who would you be willing to shake their hand and say i'm going to take this person's word for it and we're just going to leave it at that as opposed to who you have to have four signatures three witnesses and all of these documents right, right? <laughs> you know what i'm saying so so i think that i think as rich uh, points out like it's, it comes down to credibility, right? This isn't somebody you would shake their hand, take their word for it, walk away and say, we're going to believe her uh, on, especially when they have the burden of proof. That is, uh, that, that's why we bring them on, folks. Again, what, I would love to see that moment in the courtroom because to me, that's, that's resonating. What you just said, Michael, is resonating really? with me and I'm going to steal it from this point forward. <laughs> and, and it reminds me of, of the way my father practiced law before he became a judge. I mean, he and his law partner of, year, of decades together never had any sort of business agreement. They met online, wow. first year law students met online, became great friends, became partners, never had an agreement. They just, everything, we just split it down the middle. Never had a fight, never had an argument. It was, it was amazing. But that's, that's, that is such a great way to explain credibility. So Ann Bremner, mm -hmm. who are you shaking hands with, Johnny Depp or Ann or Amber Heard? Well, first I'm stealing it too, so I'm, I'm shaking hands with, I guess I'm shaking hands with Johnny Depp. <laughs> All right, uh, Rick King, who are you shaking hands with, Johnny Depp or Amber Heard? I have to agree with Ann. I'm shaking hands with Johnny Depp. His cadence, the way he talks, and the way he presents it ring more credible to me. I, I'm not falling for the Amber Heard story. And, and Michael, you started this whole handshake thing going. That's right. <laughs> who, are you, who are you shaking hands with? I, you know, as much as I'd like to create some controversy so we can make this more interesting for the viewers, I think this is one of the times where Ann, Rick, and I all agree. I think, I think Johnny Depp has demonstrated he's the most credible person in this case. Wow. Amazing stuff. Michael, thank you for that. All right. Uh, our think tank staying with us. When we come back, we're going to take you on the dock. A big trial that's brewing. We've been talking about it for a while. The killer clown trial. We'll have a preview when we return.
the free app now. 30 years ago, a person dressed as a clown, holding flowers and balloons, rang the doorbell at Marlene Warren's home. But when Marlene answered, the clown shot her to death. It was uh, <clears throat> one of the worst days of my life. Advanced DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. The defendant ended up marrying the victim's husband. She wanted to marry him. She had to get rid of his wife. This is going to be a riveting case, pairing a classic lover's triangle with a modern forensics. It's like a lifetime movie plot. We're talking about 30 years ago. You know, memories fade, evidence fade. They can take the lack of evidence and create reasonable doubt. I have seen convictions in cases, even though they're no murder weapon or no body. From my knowledge of the case, she's innocent. I mean, this is an unreal case. Okay, on the docket tonight, another big case that we are tracking that is just around the corner. The killer clown trial down in Florida. Ted Rollins has the story for us tonight. It started out as a typical day for the Warren family living on this quiet street in Wellington, Florida, an equestrian community just north of Miami. That morning, I do remember we were eating breakfast. Um, nice, calm Saturday, I believe it was. Joe Ahrens was 21 years old at the time. He will remember that Saturday for the rest of his life. It was May 26th, 1990. A clown carrying balloons and flowers came to the Aaron's door. Joe's mom, Marlene Aaron's Warren, reached for the flowers and was fatally shot twice in the face. It was uh, one of the worst days of my life. Aaron's heard the gunfire and ran to find his mother in a pool of blood. He saw the clown walk away and disappear into a white car, but had no clue who the killer was, and neither did police. The case would go cold for decades. Then, finally, after 27 years, a break. Advanced DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. Testing has evolved over time, and there were apparently some pieces of evidence that they wanted to re-examine, and they sent it to an FBI lab. And it's unclear which part of that led to the arrest, but something stuck, and that's how they were able to make the arrest. Keen Warren was living in Virginia. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for the shooting death of Joe Aaron's mother, Marlene Warren. I could not grieve because there was no closure in the case. Authorities suspected Sheila was having an affair with Marlene's husband, Michael Warren. Michael and Sheila eventually married in 2002. She was living with him at the time of her arrest. The trail that led investigators to Sheila Keen Warren contained many twists. One of them, a deathbed confession from John Moran, a family friend. John Moran passed away, but before he died, he shared a secret with his son, John Moran Jr. My father told me everything that happened before he died. I knew where the car was. I knew who planned it. I knew where the gun was at. John Moran Sr. worked with Michael Warren, who was married to the victim. Warren was questioned by police but never charged in his wife's murder. He was a used car dealer who was later arrested on charges of grand theft, odometer, tampering, and racketeering. Warren's friend, John Moran, told his son before he died that Warren may have had something to do with his wife's death. On his deathbed, he told me that car would get me anything I ever wanted for my Warren. Moran Jr. told detectives that Michael Warren tried to bribe him. Investigators followed up on details Moran Jr. gave them, including information about what could have been the killer clown's getaway car. John Moran Jr. said his dad told him where some of the evidence was kept. Police went diving in a Palm Beach canal where Moran Jr. says he and his father helped dump the evidence. However, investigators did not find the clown costume or murder weapon. Without that evidence, police can't make a case for murder against Sheila Keen Warren, according to their lawyer. I do know enough about this case, not from the discovery process, but from my knowledge of the case, that she's innocent. All right, let's bring back in our guests. Um, you know, I look at this trial, um, Ann Bremner, and the first thing that strikes me is, is in the beginning, the son who was there, 
described the clown as being kind of tall. And, and, and for years, they right. thought it was a man. That, you know, we can look back and say, oh, back then he thought it was a man, but it turned out to be a woman. No, that becomes a big issue at trial. That becomes a huge issue at trial. Yeah, it's the issue at trial. And, and his lawyer, the lawyer for the, the defendant is not off base, really, in what he made a comment about, about the strength of the case and innocence of the client. I mean, the fact is, it's an old case. And I witnessed testimony in an old case where basically they've got it wrong in terms of the description. That's going to be a tough burden for the prosecutor to get beyond. I, I think it's a, it's just a very, very difficult case. I remember the reading about this case over the years and thinking, huh, I mean, how are they going to prove this? Especially given the initial description from the son. And he would have every incentive to be accurate and to get the right person prosecuted. Michael Sterling, I, I believe prosecutors will attempt to tie Sheila Keen Warren to some balloons that were purchased that day, as well as a clown costume. Now, I don't have a clown costume at home. I don't know if, <laughs> if you keep one in the closet, Michael. I'm not yeah. sure. But it's kind, of, it's kind of unusual. It's not a thing that everyone has. So if they can connect the defendant to a clown costume, even though they don't have it, but someone testifying about it, and some balloons, uh, that moves the ball a little bit. I don't know beyond a reasonable doubt, but it gets you gets you a little bit closer. Yeah, Vinny, and uh, that, that that is what we call circumstantial evidence, which is as good as uh, direct evidence, as the jury will be instructed. And so circumstantial evidence is evidence that, you know, there's not an eyewitness who says, I saw the person shoot the person, but there is circumstances that demonstrate the person, you know, likely committed the crime or, or there's some circumstances that lead jurors to believe and circumstantial evidence is, uh, as the jury will be instructed, is just as good as direct evidence. I like to say, uh, Vinny, if you, uh, if I didn't see you eat the cookie, if I didn't see one of my kids eat the cookie, but I see the chocolate chips on the floor leading to one of my son's bedrooms and I see the chocolate on his mouth, then there's some circumstantial evidence he was in the cookie jar and it wasn't the other son. <laughs> Even if he shook your hand and said, Dad, I didn't do it? <laughs> that was good. good. And the, the other part of this, Ann, and, and this is a big part of the story when it comes to, to motive, is she ends up marrying. Now, not immediately. It's years later they get married, but there is mm -hmm. an alleged romantic connection that may have preceded the murder of Marlene Warren. Well, that's a big one for me. I mean, if I was on the jury, and I think it's a big one for a lot of potential jurors. I mean, she ends up marrying him. Like my grandma used to say, what a coinky thing, you know? I mean, does, you can't really make that up. So there's your motive right there. And that, you know, jurors take a leap of faith in murder cases, I think. When I was a prosecutor, I saw that all the time. You might have not have the strongest case in the world, but they'll still kind of take a leap of faith, you know, if they if they really think, you know, I really think the person did it, and it's a serious, serious crime, it's homicide. Now, the one piece of evidence that's been alluded to, but we don't know exactly what it is and, and what level of evidence it is, but there's supposed to be some enhanced DNA that may have been the mm -hmm. final piece that led to uh, the charges here. Uh, Michael Sterling, if... If, if the jurors believe in that DNA, to me, in, in, in 2022, jurors will latch on to that. But I think mm -hmm. it's going to be challenged uh, by the defense in, in whether or not it's reliable or not and how they got it all these years later. Uh, but that could be another crucial part of this case. Yeah, Vinny, we've seen the opposite happen, right? In many cases, we've seen where 25 years later, DNA evidence exonerates someone, right? So we've seen cases come out where DNA evidence makes it very clear that this person wasn't the individual who committed the crime. So what we're having here is the opposite, where the DNA evidence, as you point out, Vinny, if the jurors believe it, despite potential challenges from the defense, it could demonstrate that this is actually the person who committed the crime. And so the, you know, the uh, advanced scientific technology and the advances in DNA could potentially be what uh, does Sheila Keen Warren in. All right, folks, take a look at the trial date. It's a lot closer than you think. June 3rd. You know we're in the midst of covering Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. 
Uh, closing arguments in that case have already been scheduled because each side's been allotted a certain number of hours, minutes, and seconds to present their cases. Closing arguments are the Friday before Memorial Day weekend at the end of May, June 3rd, Florida versus Sheila Keen Warren, the killer clown trial. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk more about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Um, a lot of people were asking the question, well, if, if Amber Heard was, was abused for all those years, why would she marry Johnny Depp? Well, I turned that upside down on you today. I asked you, why do you think Johnny Depp married Amber Heard? Your verdict next. E dot com. And it was really sweet. He got down on 
one knee and said, I want you to be my girl, be my girl forever, my woman, my girl. I want you to be the rest of my life. Say yes to me. Uh, he said he wanted to spend every, every day. Uh, he, he promised me that every day when I woke up, that I would wake up and he would make me smile at least once. And that would be his goal. And, you know, I, I looked into his eyes and I saw my future hope, you know, like blind hope, so in love. It was one of the most, I can't describe that kind of joy, you know, I thought, you know, if we were married, then this is real. This is real. This isn't a thing of, this isn't chaotic. Can you, this will change. You know, I just, I had so much hope in that moment. Um, and I just said to him over and over again, are you serious? Are you real? Are you, are you serious? Are you sure? Cause he didn't have a ring. So I thought, is this an impulse thing? You know, my experience, Johnny could be very impulsive. And, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he said over and over again, be my, be my, be my woman forever. I want you to be my wife, my wife, my wife. Um, I of course cried and we had a wonderful evening. Amber Heard describing the proposal to, to be married. Remember, this is after a lot of violence, a lot of violence, a lot of chaos, as she described in, in all of that. And there she sort of addresses why she is saying yes or is going to marry him. But the question I asked you today on social media is, why do you think Johnny Depp married Amber Heard? We begin with our 13th juror comment of the day. Tonight coming from Marini who says, maybe I'm just a romantic, but from what he testified to, I truly think he thought he'd found the love of his life, the love that some people go their whole lives without finding. Ah, Rick King, let me ask you about love tonight. What, what do you, what's your take on this relationship? Because the jury has to figure out this relationship and why they decided to get married. But like, why, he's the one that proposes. Why do, you, why do you think? When you listen to Johnny Depp during his direct and when he was talking about how the way that he felt about Amber Heard, he, again, the credibility of Johnny Depp, he seemed like this was the person for me. He talked about, you know, find the joy with her. And uh, despite maybe what was going on, I think, because, you know, you have to imagine that there are, for whatever you believe, that there's two sides of what Johnny Depp is going through. It's, it's sober Johnny Depp, and it's, you know, drug-induced Johnny Depp. But both of those people found the commonality of love for Amber Heard at that time. And I think that's why he moves forward. I mean, love makes you do crazy things, man. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's that saying. There's a there's a thin line between love and eight. Mary tonight. He has a history of proposing early in relationships to ladies he's worked with, probably wanted to control her. She was much younger than him and vulnerable. This is a love story I wished wasn't so toxic. They probably would have been perfect together. Unfortunately, drugs and alcohol can ruin any relationship. Uh, Mary, clearly not on Team Johnny uh, and Bremner. Um, what, do you, what do you think of the age difference? And do, does that play any role with the jury in trying to figure out what's going on here? Well, it might, but I don't know if the vulnerable part, you know, is really, that piece is really there. You know, I agree with Rick. It is crazy. Love can be crazy. And I had, I heard a great quote once that was basically falling in love is a short form of insanity. And when you come out of that, you better hope you're with the right person. And that's kind of how I see this case, right? I mean, it's like, it is crazy, but it's a different insanity than you're on the other side. And who is that person that you just idolized and fell madly in love with? All right, here comes Dottie. You ready, Michael? I don't think it was love. It was lust. Wow. You know, it's, it's interesting in, in the descriptions of their relationship, the, 
there's no real talk about the lusts. And I don't know, mm. there's more about like we, right. we shared this love of the same poetry, mm -hmm. the same authors. We would recite the same poems. We, we listen to old yeah. blues. Uh, Michael, what mm. do you think about the lust factor here? Did he find an old soul in a young body? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't think it was lust. I mean, uh, you know, he, he, you know, I, I, I haven't watched the Pirates of the Caribbean, Vinny, Vinny, but you know, this is Johnny Depp. I'm sure if there was lust involved, he probably could have explored it in many different capacities. Uh, as a movie star who was making millions and millions <laughs> of dollars, uh, but as he testified to. Uh, you know, he, he talked about it, as you pointed out, Vinny, he talked about, man, she shared my love of literature. She shared my love of old blues. She knew these, you know, arcane blues musicians that most people didn't know about. So I think there was some sort of shared interest. And a lot of times what happens is you think, man, I'm never going to find this anywhere else. I'm not going to find someone who has this anywhere else. And so you get locked in, right? You get locked mm -hmm. in to this idea. We are out of time. Great job tonight. Michael Sterling, Ann Bremner, Rick King, the Love Doctors. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you again. We'll be right back. Thanks, man.